Good morning and good evening to everybody. I really welcome you all for today's webinar series in the month of July for Web Platform for Dialogue. Web Platform for Dialogue is a forum where we can share, we can dialogue with each other without any kind of prejudice, without any kind of free assumption. So that's the main motto of Web Platform for Dialogue. And we have our favorite tagline that's connecting minds in bits and bytes. So with this using the particular time of this isolation period in the particular era of COVID-19, let's utilize the sense of knowledge, the essence of knowledge. And we can able to share our thoughts with outside world. So this is out of the box way to know something which we don't know before. So I welcome, and it's my privilege to welcome Dr. Edward Lee. He is a professor in a history at Winthrop University. He is author of almost 15 books, including two on Vietnam War. He frequently is a media commentator on a wide range of historical topics. He has, during his 35 years of career, won several teaching awards. Today, he will lecture about America's longest war with Vietnam. That is very, very important to know because most of us, we really don't know about that. So I really, really welcome Dr. Edward Lee, Professor Lee, for today's webinar series. And I hand over the session to you. After your lecture, we will definitely have some question answer from our participants. Okay. I bring you greetings from the state of South Carolina on this beautiful but hot July morning. It's 9.30 a.m. here in the United States, and I'm sitting on my front porch. The coffee is being brewed, and the bagels and pastries are being enjoyed all across America, and I want to thank those of you who are with us in other time zones for giving up some of their Saturday. People are with us from Australia to Vietnam, actually, and I'm delighted about that. And of course, the United States and some of my colleagues here, and of course, India. Special thanks goes to Web Platform for Dialogue for sponsoring this and other stimulating events. We will in the future, and you alluded to this just a minute ago, but we will in the future teach in non-traditional ways from 21st century platforms. And you have been a pioneer in that endeavor. And you said a minute ago, the pursuit of knowledge, and that's actually what this is, the pursuit of knowledge. I thank you. I have entitled my comments today, The First Mistake, America in Vietnam, 1945 to 1954. And I will share my thoughts on the first mistake of America's longest war. It is still America's longest war, 1945 to 1975. And what I will do in the next few minutes, I will try to identify the first mistake and a lot of other mistakes that my country made. And perhaps there are valuable lessons to be learned as we pursue knowledge. Most of my students at Winthrop University were born after, think about this for a minute, most of my students at Winthrop University were born after the tragic events of 9-11. Those young students missed the Vietnam War. Most of them did. One of my former students who earned a master's degree at my institution fought in the Vietnam War, but most of my students miss the Vietnam War. And for that generation, the young generation, the 9-11 generation, 
war has always focused over the last 19 years since 9-11, since September the 11th, 2001. It is always focused on the Middle East and Afghanistan, to be specific. But you and I know that we understand, and many of us who are older with gray hair, we all understand that there was a longer war. And it stretched from the first American soldier who died in that war in 1945. He was Lieutenant Colonel A. Peter Dewey. And that war stretched from the death of Lieutenant Colonel Dewey in 1945 until the last casualty in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, in April 1975, 30 years. I've spent much of my career in the academic world sorting through the debris of that conflict, and that's what historians do. They sort through the debris of past events, listening to the voices, collecting the photographs and the letters and the diaries and the artifacts and telling the story. The stories, some tragic and some courageous and assessing the mistakes that were made by America. And I would say this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first mistake, but I'll talk about other mistakes too, but the first mistake was made early in 1945. We'll discuss that in just a few minutes. So when you look at the long list of American presidents who participated in the mistakes, it begins with Franklin Roosevelt, <laughs> Harry Truman, to Dwight Eisenhower, to John Kennedy, to Lyndon Johnson, to Richard Nixon, to Gerald Ford. We can learn from mistakes. We can learn from the per first mistake, which occurred in 1945, but we can learn from the mistakes that were made for that 30 year period. It is America's longest war. In 1999, I published my first book on America's Longest War. It is entitled White Christmas in April, The Collapse of South Vietnam. And as some of you know, Bing Crosby's famous Christmas song, White Christmas, was played on Radio Saigon in April of 1975 as a signal to the remaining Americans in Vietnam that it was time to evacuate. And so I entitled that first book, White Christmas in April, because that song was played on Radio Saigon and it was time to evacuate America's Longest War. That book was well received and I enjoyed working on it. And in April of 2000, I was invited to speak at a ceremony at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington. You've all seen that memorial. You've all probably been to that memorial and you know what that memorial is. It's a solemn piece of real estate in the nation's capital in this country. It's that memorial with more than 58,000 American names. And during my research for that first Vietnam book, I had interviewed General Homer Smith. General Homer Smith was the last American commander in Vietnam, the last. So General Homer Smith invited me to, to come to that ceremony on the site of the Vietnam Memorial in April of 2000 to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the end of the war. And I considered it to be an honor and I did not fight in that war. I was in college during that war, and but I, I have appreciation for what that war is and has been and what we must learn from that war. And when General Homer Smith invited me to attend and participate in that ceremony, I said I'd be glad to. And General Smith said, I want you to tell the story 
And so when I stood there at the memorial in April of 2000, I said, I want to thank you all. And I, I really don't think, and I was much younger then, I don't think I did a very good job with my comments. And, and then General Smith turned to me and he said, I want to thank you for telling our story. And I turned back to him and I said, I want to thank you and the others here this morning and the many family members and the names on this memorial and the Vietnamese who are not listed on this memorial. I want to thank you. And then I concluded my comments that April 2000 morning by saying mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. And I looked out in the crowd and many of the people were emotional by that point. They were wearing their old Vietnam War uniforms. Some had their medals with them. A few were hobbling on artificial legs or missing arms even. And when I made that comment, mistakes were made. They began to weep, and I said, but you didn't make them. You didn't make them. So I've been trying to figure out who made the mistakes. Ever since then, I've been trying to figure out who made the mistakes and who should we as scholars hold accountable for the mistakes. And that's what many of us who are together today, that's what we do is we sort through the debris of history and we figure out what it tells us and how to tell the story and who to hold accountable for the mistakes. So mistakes were made in America's longest war. But those men and those women and their eight female names on that memorial in Washington, those men and those women did not make the mistakes. And then in 2002, I wrote another book on America's Longest War. And its title is Nixon, Ford, and the Abandonment of South Vietnam. Nixon, Ford, and the Abandonment of South Vietnam. And you might be able to tell from the title who I hold accountable for that war. Let me sum that up by saying I hold accountable the occupants of the White House. The occupants of the White House, specifically when it comes to that second book, President Richard Nixon and President Gerald Ford. Both of those books focused on the war's last days, 1973 to 1975. By then, a lot of those names on that Vietnam Memorial were ready for that memorial because we had lost 58,000 Americans and a couple of million Vietnamese. And so most of my earlier research has been on the last days of the war, 1973 to 1975. And I promised myself that I would someday return to America's longest war and write about how it began. How it began and not how it ended. So in May, I finished that third book that I promised myself in 2002 that I would write. And I entitled it, and the title really of what we're talking about today, The First Mistake. America in Vietnam, 1945 to 1954. 1945 is, of course, the year that Franklin Roosevelt died. It's the year that we made our first mistake. As a country, we made our first mistake. And the French came back. They resumed colonial control of Vietnam and then in 1954, they were defeated. And so the time frame for this third book is 1945 to 1954. And let me say that I wrote that book for my grandchildren. 
I wrote that book for my grandchildren and I wrote it for my students. And I mentioned earlier about my students being so young and untested and, and, and they really don't know anything about the war that I'm talking about today, but I wrote this third book for them and for your students and for your children and grandchildren. Well, it's entitled The First Mistake. So let me get to the point. The first mistake was to misunderstand colonialism. Now, many of you that are viewing this presentation from your vantage points, you understand colonialism. I'm sure India understands colonialism. And I'm sure there are other countries that understand colonialism. And I think that Franklin Roosevelt, who in the last year of his life, I think he, as my students would say, he got it. He understood colonialism and what Franklin Roosevelt was trying to do. And he was a tremendous persuasive president. What he was trying to do is what you and I do. He was trying to multitask. He was trying to defeat the Nazis. He was trying to defeat the Japanese and he was trying to prepare the world for the future. And you know, he was sick and he was dying, but he understood colonialism. And he told his son in a conversation that I use in my book, you know, and this is Franklin Roosevelt, the quote, he says, you know, Jimmy being Jimmy Roosevelt, he says, Jimmy Roosevelt, Jimmy, France has milked Indochina for a hundred years. And you know, one reason that I admire Franklin Roosevelt on many levels is he could sum it up nicely. That use of that word, milked, France had milked Vietnam for a hundred years. And the French had milked the economy. And they had milked the society, and they had favored certain religious groups or ethnic groups. And they manipulated the politics and they denied the Vietnamese self-determination. And they denied the Vietnamese independence. So Franklin Roosevelt, in the last year of his life, he got it. He understood that the French had milked Vietnam. And you know, he spoke to Winston Churchill about it. And he told Winston Churchill, he said, and you've done the same thing to India, by the way. And sometimes, you know, I hear my students say, well, maybe we should go back in our time machines and rewrite history. Well, you know, we can't go back in our time machines and we can't rewrite history. But I think Franklin Roosevelt, if he'd lived, maybe things would have turned out differently and probably you and I would not be communicating today, but you know, it didn't happen that way. And so the debris of the war is here and it begins with the French milking Vietnam, as Franklin Roosevelt would say, denying the Vietnamese people independence, and self-determination. And I've got to quickly say this, and I, I go into tremendous detail in my book about this, and this is not a very popular thing for an American scholar to say, but I think we misunderstood Ho Chi Minh. We misunderstood Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Viet, Viet Minh. I think we misunderstood Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Viet Minh, you know, he was a communist, but he was a nationalist. And I, I think we kind of misunderstood how those two, maybe we kind of can combine them and we can kind of make it work. But we misunderstood that. And you know, there's irony there and there's always irony in history. There's irony there because 
I mentioned that the first casualty in 1945 was Lieutenant Colonel A. Peter Dewey, and he was a spy, and we called it in the last days of World War II the Office of Strategic Services, the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, and now we call it the Central Intelligence Agency, which makes more sense to everybody today, but that's what Peter Dewey was. He was a lieutenant colonel, but he was a spy. And there were other American OSS people there in Vietnam too. And they were working very well with Ho Chi Minh. And that has to be, it has to be stressed. And I stress that in my book that Ho Chi Minh was helping us find American flyers who were being downed by the Japanese. He was helping us, he was helping us rescue American POWs who were being held in captivity. And Colonel Dewey and the other American OSS officers, they got along with Ho Chi Minh in 1945 very well. And they had a conversation with Ho Chi Minh one time and they talked with him about being a communist. And he said, yes, I'm a communist. I mean, he, he admitted he was a communist and he said, but I'm a nationalist. And then Ho Chi Minh said, I can be both. And so that was one of those mistakes. It was a missed opportunity. And I think that many of you in India understand colonialism so well in your own history. We missed the opportunity in 1945 to build on the relationship that those agents like Lieutenant Colonel Dewey and those Office of Strategic Services spies they had formed a very good relationship with Ho Chi Minh. So we erred. We made a mistake. And down that slippery slope, down that slippery slope, we tumbled. And so my book begins with that. 1945. I think Franklin Roosevelt understood colonialism had to be ended. But, you know, he was succeeded by Harry Truman. And Harry Truman had very little foreign policy experience. He had served in the military as an artillery captain in World War I and had been to France as a, as a captain in the American Army, but he had not traveled extensively. He had read extensively, but he did not have Franklin Roosevelt's understanding that beyond the borders of the United States of America, there's another world. Speaking of books, in 1945, in 1995, former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, 1995, who had helped make that first mistake that I just spent a few minutes talking about today, Robert McNamara helped make that first mistake. Robert McNamara in 1995 published his book. And you've heard of it. It's called In Retrospect. The Tragedy and the Lessons of Vietnam. In Retrospect. The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam. I decided that in my career, I would do what we do. I would reappraise America's longest war and look for that first mistake where we got it wrong and we kept getting it wrong. And that's what I've done. So let me in the next few minutes before we wrap things up and have questions on this summer morning, 2020 and hot South Carolina, share some of my thoughts about mistakes in war. Acknowledging that we 
misunderstood colonialism. People want to be free. People want to be independent. People want to practice self-determination. I think FDR understood that, but he didn't live to see it implemented. He understood that when he said that the French had milked the Vietnamese economy, controlled the political system, and favored certain religious groups or ethnic groups, and denied self-determination. I gave the list a minute ago. And we as Americans, we should have known. We should have known from our own experience. Because, you know, we were colonies once. And we just celebrated the most American of holidays, July 4th. I have two members of my family tree who signed the Declaration of Independence. I mean, we should understand independence. We should understand self-determination. We should understand colonies. We should have understood it in 1945. We should have understood independence and basic freedom. But we made the mistake, the first mistake, in 1945, and we created a human catastrophe for Southeast Asia and for us. Back to the McNamara book for a minute, Robert McNamara. And of course, he was John Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, and continued in the Johnson years until he realized that it was a big mess and then he went to the World Bank. When his book came out in 1995, Robert McNamara's book in retrospect, there were some cartoonists, and I love cartoonists, and you love them too in your publications, to have that artistic talent to take a pen and be able to kind of like make the point with the end of the pen on a sheet of paper. So when Robert McNamara's book in retrospect came out in 1995, those cartoonists, they were, they were brutal. They used pens like I have in my hand today. They used pens like surgeons use scalpels, slicing away at the subject at hand. And when that book came out, in retrospect by former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, editorial cartoonist had a field day. Let me sketch for you a couple of those cartoons because they're very appropriate for looking at mistakes in war. One of them was in the Bangor, Maine daily newspaper. And it depicted that Vietnam memorial wall that I spoke at in 2000 with General Homer Smith and the others. And that cartoon from that Bangor, Maine newspaper, I call it the voice from the wall. The voice from the wall. Because in the cartoon, there is no one standing around. In that cartoon, there's no one there. No one alive there. No one alive there. And then there comes a voice from the wall in that cartoon from that main newspaper, and it says this. In retrospect, this is the quote, in retrospect, I wish that Robert McNamara had spoken up earlier. Remember, his book was entitled In Retrospect. In retrospect, I wish Robert McNamara had spoken up earlier. And I would add there that when policymakers in any country make mistakes, when they make mistakes, they should do what you and I do in the classroom and in our jobs of whatever our positions are and what we do with our families. When you make a mistake, you acknowledge it and you speak up at the time that you make the mistake so it can be corrected. 
without pain and suffering. The Vietnam Memorial is featured in another cartoon that I found. This time it's in another newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the name of the newspaper, 1995. Once again, it has the Vietnam Memorial there in the background. It's a very powerful thing, and I refer to it in my book because it's just something about going to that memorial and reading those names. So in that artwork, in that cartoon, two aging veterans are standing at the wall. And one leans on cane. One leans on a cane. And the other veteran is doing, and I see this from time to time when I go to Washington, stenciling the, the name of a falling, stenciling the name of a fallen comrade off the wall. And the cane holding veteran says this, Robert McNamara issued, this is a quote again, Robert McNamara issued a statement saying our involvement in Vietnam was wrong. And then there's, and that's a quote, and then there's a ghostly voice from the wall again, and it says, now he tells us. You see, when we made that series of mistakes, beginning with the first one in 1945, not understanding colonialism and how wrong it is, when we made that first mistake, we made lots of mistakes. And then Robert McNamara writes his book. And let me just give you, we got a couple of minutes before we stop for questions, my third, my favorite cartoon. I teach, as you mentioned, at Winthrop University, which has about 6,000 students, and right across the state line is Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a large city, and the newspaper there is the Charlotte Observer. The cartoonist is a friend of mine. He's, his name is Kevin Sears. He's still the cartoonist. He was the cartoonist in 1995 when the McNamara book came out. And so he did a cartoon about that McNamara book, and I've told him that I liked it a lot. And in his cartoon, you've all seen this image, the real image, the picture. There's a burning village an 11-year-old girl burning from napalm. Horror and pain on her face. Tears everywhere engulfing the faces of the innocent. And then in the background of that cartoonist, my friend Kevin Sears' cartoon, in the back it says, Robert McNamara says, oops, oops. There's almost something surreal about how we Americans made that first mistake and then other mistakes, and sometimes we just go, oops. So we sort through the ashes of our longest war. And let me say on this beautiful day in South Carolina, and maybe I should lower my voice, but we Americans do not like losing. We don't like losing in sports. We don't like losing in politics. We don't accept losing gracefully. But I really think that in a way, that's a real talent in this country, my country. We don't like to lose. And so, as my father told me one time, when you lose, don't make a habit of it. So we learn from losing. Well, maybe we learn from losing. We don't like to lose, but we lost that war. And I discussed that in my third book. I discussed that in my third book. And so let me end and then we'll start questions. And I learned in early in my career, 35 years ago, what you do is you never go over your time. You never go over your time because I never liked in graduate school professors who went over their time. 
And I always like professors that have plenty of time for questions. And I always like to make sure that I looked at my watch. And I learned in graduate school to be careful about professors who take their watch off. Because if they take their watch off, you're in trouble. And you'll notice that I kept mine on my, on my wrist. And so we're going to end on time, but we're going to have time for questions about mistakes in war and about misunderstanding Ho Chi Minh, perhaps, and what we can learn from colonialism. We'll have time for that. So let me end on time with Robert McNamara again, the former defense secretary. In his book, in retrospect, the book that the cartoonists lambasted, the, the book that the cartoonists kind of made fun of him and they should have made fun of him. This is what he said, and I'm quoting this passage. And it's a lengthy passage, but it's the perfect passage to end with. Quoting Robert McNamara on Vietnam. People are human. They are fallible. I concede that with painful candor and a heavy heart that that applies to me in my generation of America's leadership regarding Vietnam. And I'm going to continue with the quotation, of course. Although we sought to do the right thing, and we believe that we were doing the right thing, McNamara says, in my judgment, hindsight proves us wrong. We overestimated everything on our side and underestimated everything on their side. And we thought that the security of the West was at stake, McNamara says, and it wasn't. And so he says, we misunderstood that we thought that if the South Vietnamese were going to be saved, that we had to save them. That we had to save them. And then he ends that quotation, that passage, he says, we built a progressively more massive air effort on an inherently unstable foundation. Let me reread that final line and then we'll stop and get questions and comments. We built a progressively more massive effort on an inherently unstable foundation. So let's stop there and let's get questions and comments if anybody would like to do that. And let me, let me start that. And you know how to do this, of course, but the web platform people, they know how to find me. And, and let me say that's a good thing when you're doing creative things. We were in communication early today, and that's a real compliment because that's the way that if we're going to teach the way we're teaching, and if we're going to promote knowledge the way we're going to do it, like we just did it, we have to keep in touch. And so you know where to find me, as we say in South Carolina, and you know where to find me. So let me tell everybody where to find me. I am on Facebook and it'll say Edward Lee, but that's not, if you don't want to use that, you don't have to, but let me give you my email address. Now, having taught 35 years, that goes back to when there was an email. And when there was email, I refused to use it because there was no substitute for sitting in the office with a colleague or a student. There was no substitute for that. And then finally, one day, the, the person at my university who was in charge of technology came to my office. And I had taught his daughter, and he came to my office, and he shut the door. And I think he might have even locked the door, which was a little bit different. And, and he said, look, we've got to use email. So now I use it. I answer it. I enjoy it. So let me give you that email address. It would be L E E E. So there are three E's there. My first name is Edward and my last name is Lee. So it will be lowercase L E E E at Winthrop W I N T H R O P. That's the university I teach at dot E D U.
lee at winthrop.edu. Thank you so much for your attention. Let's get a comment or a question if we could. It's a wonderful to hear you, that's, you know, uh, we really uh, don't know much about the mistakes, but uh, we really don't want to actually hear or discuss about our mistakes. So it's really, really wonderful uh, uh, comments mm -hmm. and wonderful discussions with you. And I open the floor now to have a question, a quick question. We have some time in our hands, but uh, I really would like to give all of you equal opportunity to speak. So if you have any questions, just unmute yourself, introduce you with one, two lines, and have your question directly to Professor Edwards. And while you're getting your questions ready, I'm so delighted to see my Turkish friend there, in a, and she's in the corner of, of my screen. She's getting ready to start her doctorate, and it's early in it, it, it's early in Boston, Massachusetts. But you were seated there, and so the professor always knows when the students are on time. So, Aslim, I want to thank you for coming, and it's good to see you this morning. Okay, questions yes, or comments? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So I, I really welcome you, Aslim. So. Uh, for this particular webinar, you make possible to come here, and it's a great privilege to have you with us. So, if you have any question, uh, you can ask directly to Professor Lee, and, or else you can just type in the chat box so I can ask on behalf of you. Yeah. So, if anybody uh, would like to prepare their question in the meantime, I would like to ask something to Edward. Uh, that what would be the uh, take away from the mistake because when we discuss about the mistake we need to clarify and we need to uh, make it possible for the next generation to not to repeat that because that's what our duty for the next generation to make them aware first and then the take away from the mistake not to repeat so what would be your uh, comment on this particular Sure. That's a great opening question, and I would say not everybody is the same, and not everybody wants to be the same. Not everybody wants to be an American, not everybody wants to be an Indian, not everybody wants to be a Turk, not everybody, and we have to understand that, and I have a chapter in my book about and you know, no one is better or no one is more exceptional than other people. We're all people and we all are individuals and we all deserve basic liberties. Now, we have to accept that and we have to appreciate that and we have to make that work. And sometimes that's difficult. And I would just say, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, get sidetracked because I know there might be somebody else wanting to, to interject something. But when Harry Truman made the decision that the Cold War had begun and we were going to win the Cold War between us and the Soviet Union, and he was determined that Vietnam was not going to be communist, when he made that decision in 1945. And when he turned his back on Ho Chi Minh and the relationship that had been fostered by those American spies, when he did that, down that slippery slope, we tumbled. Because not everybody wants to be like us. And remember, Ho Chi Minh said, I'm a communist, but I'm a nationalist. And then Ho Chi Minh said, but can't we be friends? My answer to that is, it worked in Yugoslavia with Marshal Tito. We can be friends. So thanks for that comment and that question. Thank you so much. Yes, Professor Anirudhavon. Professor, good to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. Uh, I don't know whether you have already answered that question because uh, I was playing truant for some time. Uh, I'm interested in knowing the war veterans, those who returned from Vietnam, how were they actually treated by the society out there? And the government they were treated they've been treated horribly my brother 
is a much older than me and he is a Vietnam veteran and he came back and had a period of adjustment and he did go on and it had a happy ending and he did go on to law school and became an attorney. But, you know, it was difficult. Some people had a much more difficult time. I think some people that I hear from that are older than me, they're still adjusting. And you hear all the time, and you mentioned this, and I'm glad you brought it up. You hear all the time that no one appreciated them. And that's why when I was at that ceremony at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, I wanted not just General Smith, but the enlisted personnel and the people who were, who were just, as we would say, grunts, meaning people who were, you know, privates or sergeants or corporals, I wanted them to know that they were appreciated. Uh, they don't think they were appreciated, to, to answer your question. And I think that they're, they're, they're right about that. They're, they're right about that. They weren't appreciated. Uh, one more point. Uh, I was told, I haven't read it anywhere actually, that the soldiers out there, the American soldiers out there in Vietnam, they used to cut the ears of the Vietnamese as they hang in their rooms or houses or whatever. It's kind of a sign of victory that they have been able to capture so many Vietnamese or punish them. Is that so really? And I'm forgetting that there was a term used, and forget their term. Well, atrocities, atrocities were committed by both sides. Yeah. What you have mentioned, yes, it did occur. And some more ghastly atrocities that we won't talk about. Not just ears. I would say this about war in general, and I know that's not really the topic today, but it could be because we have talked about war now for 45 minutes, and I think that we've had a good discussion of war. It never works out as planned. It never works out as planned. After that first Vietnam book came out, White Christmas in April, I was asked to come and lecture at the U.S. Army War College, which is in Pennsylvania. So it was fun to do that. And I went up to the U.S. Army War College and there were people there. And these are people who are preparing to move up to become generals eventually. They had committed. They had committed some pretty ghastly acts in combat. In war atrocities occur. I would say this though, they happened on both sides, both or maybe sides. I should go a little further than that, they happened on all sides. Uh, one of the images that I have in my new book is of um, a Buddhist monk who is, he's doused himself with gasoline and he ignited himself as a protest on one of the main streets in Saigon. You've seen that image I imagine and you know, he was driven to that point because the president of Vietnam's sister-in-law had no sympathy for Buddhists. And so he burned himself alive and the sister-in-law said, oh, it's just a barbecue. What a terrible word, just a barbecue for the death of a religious figure on the streets of Saigon. That was in 1963. Thank you for asking that. That's two good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If anybody would like to ask something, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Berman, for this wonderful question. Because more and more questions will uh, actually clarify our doubts, our uh, pre-assumptions. We have lots of pre-assumptions, and as well as me, regarding the Vietnam War. But uh, uh, it, it's really wonderful to hear uh, uh, Professor Edward this wonderful session. And if you have any questions, you can directly ask to Professor Lee. Or else we can have a round of uh, conclusion and concluding remarks from Professor Lee uh, with the 
with the after effects and uh, what the now you know the current uh, gen generation in us they are uh, they are in a dilemma or they are actually enjoying the superiority uh, in such a way that uh, we can see the leadership process also been in a very superior in america so what is your uh, opinion that the superiority in the leadership of the process is actually penetrated into the generation by generation and the current generation is actually that's, that's, enjoying the superiority that's a great that's a great opener for the next couple of minutes you know I was telling my friend from Turkey, Oslo, I was telling her that um, I'm a, I'm ancient. And when you're ancient, you, you know, I've taught for a long time. And I'm getting ready to start my 36th year. I've taught 35 years. Now, what that means is, and this is kind of sobering on a Saturday morning, folks. I have taught parents and children. So I have taught one generation and a second generation in some families. And I have noticed in the last five years a real thirst among the, the 18 year olds, the children of the ones that I taught in 1985 or grandchildren. There's a real thirst. I'm reassured about that. I'm reassured about that. That's a very good thing. And I hope you're going to see that in your in your interactions with them. There's a there's a there's something good happening in young minds right now. And one of the good things that's happening, they are they are wizards when it comes to technology. And when I ask them to research something, that used to take their parents two weeks. You know, they have it in 15 minutes. So they live in a different world. Now, I must say this, though, and this is one reason that we're here today. And this is one reason that web platform, I mean, your, your whole dialogue series has been such a gift. When the coronavirus came, of course, I was teaching and I was teaching classes like we teach, not from my front porch. And it was like we were put on pause. You know, the old VCR where you'd push the pause button and go get something to drink. And it was like we were put on pause. That happened in March. And we had to finish the semester a different way. And then this summer I had to teach online. And then in the fall, I'll be teaching online. But you know what? We can do that. And one reason we can do that and make that work is those 18 year olds that you ask about. They can make that work. Can you tell me what do we have? We have time for one more observation, perhaps. Uh, yes, wonderful. We have one. Uh, we have some uh, more minutes to have um, last question. If anybody would like to ask, because then the time will be up. Or we, uh, actually, I would really love to have another uh, session because uh, I came to know so many thing for the first time so uh if uh, edward uh, would have some time i'm sorry i'm uh, you know more familiar with edward professor edward uh, if we will have some time we can have uh, this a part two of the uh today's session so we are almost at the end of the discussion if anybody would like to have another question yeah we we do need one more session with him we do need to. I didn't quite hear that observation, Professor. What definitely, was that? definitely. What was that? Please go ahead. I didn't quite hear it again. Let's see, what was the observation? Um, Dr. Bauman, would you like to? No, no, no. Yes. Any, any uh, I, I just like, uh, we could go into details of this later on. But 
in one more session like this. I just wanted to have you once again in this kind of webinar. It's great. Let me let me just perfect, add one. Perfect. I have to add one final promotion. Okay. Please. I mentioned. Please, please. I mentioned my friend from Turkey. She is conducting wonderful research on the genocide of Armenians in 1915. Oh. And genocide is something that just it does not just mean the Holocaust of Nazi Germany. It does not, and, and I'm not making light of that. It does not just mean that. There has been genocide on other occasions on other continents. And I just wanted to, to give Oslam a a plug there that she'll keep her in mind for that. And her research on the genocide of 1915 of Armenians, it, we need to tell that story. We need to tell that story. Oslam, Oslam, uh, I really, I will contact with you. Uh, maybe we'll have a round of discussion with you and with your research work because we really want to know uh, the observation, the finding of your research. So if you have some time, I will con connect with you. That could be another for me. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you Aslan. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lee, uh, so, uh, we are almost at the end of our discussion. So uh, <clears throat> some more, uh, uh, just keywords, some keywords you would like to share with us your well, I'm uh, gonna... previous research with this wonderful yes well you've been so kind and you are pioneers in this type of exchange of knowledge you are pioneers on this because this is the way it's going to be and there might be resistance to it some some places but this is the way it's going to be and we have to exchange information this way so i want to i want to give you a claim again for doing this and being one of the first to do this. And I have followed you and looked at the various programs and lectures and correspondence and publications that you're having. And the one about India and South Korea, the one about India and South Korea, wasn't that one yesterday? India and South Korea. I think that was a publication. That's very, yeah. very important yes, yes. to sponsor that. Now, I would just kind of end my part of the program because Thank we you. have two Thank minutes. You. Remember, I did not take my watch off. Um, I would end this by saying the first mistake that was made was that we Americans didn't realize that in the American Revolution, we had fought for our independence. And we had fought for our self-determination. And we didn't want to be milked by the United Kingdom anymore. And, you know, we should have understood that about Vietnam and France. And we should have understood that about us in Vietnam. That's a great way to sum it up.
be able to hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Very good. And yes. I could not hear you for about uh, two, minutes, two minutes, but it's fine. I have an issue with my mic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you. We uh, have technical difficulties all the time, so we have to overcome. So thank you so much for being with me. And uh, it's a great honor to invite you for this webinar series. And um, in the next month, we may have another discussion with you with your uh, convenient time. And uh, it's a good night from here. So it's a good day to you. So it's kind of a dialogue series that you know, we are yes. going to launch. Yes. So uh, I think uh, from mistakes, so what we can actually uh, take away for me, that is the dialogue, more and more conversation, more and more dialogue sharing will definitely give us the opportunity to know each and every one at the individual level. So I, I think in this way, we can overcome our mistakes. Yes. Good night. Thank you. I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with me. Thank you.